Good morning, church. Kids, you are dismissed to Children's Church at this time. Uh, everybody else, please uh, go to Genesis 14 again. We're going to be closing out the chapter. Before we get into it today, though, I have to uh, admit something to you. Uh, this week, my wife, who you know is also the secretary of the church, printed out these bulletins. And while she printed the bulletins, she also emailed them. And I had checked the email and looked at the title and thought, you messed that up. It says, The Bind That Ties. And it's supposed to be a play on the old hymn, The Ties That Bind. It's supposed to say, The Ties That Bind, not The Bind That Ties. And she said, Oh, I just put whatever you wrote on a piece of paper. And I said, No, I don't think so. I know that song. I didn't write that. And so we went back and forth, and I came up here last night. I had to do some work in the office anyway, and I checked her piece of paper on her desk. And sure enough, I wrote the bind that ties. I, I was wrong. And so, and she told me, she says, you have to get in front of the whole church and tell them I'm not the stupid one. So <laughs> she did not, she didn't say that. But uh, I will, in front of all of our church family, I will say, I was wrong, you were right. That's the last time you'll hear that from me. <laughs> so if you go to Genesis chapter 14, verses 17 through 24, that's where we're going to be uh, today. Last week, we covered half of this passage. We spent most of the time seeking to understand the identity of a very particular man of mystery, this, this man named Melchizedek who appears in these verses. And using what the author of Hebrews says about Melchizedek, uh, and connecting the dots that he connects. Melchizedek, we found in Genesis 14, is either a Christophany, which if you remember what a Christophany is, uh, it's an appearance of the second person of the Trinity. It very well may be a, a pre-incarnate Christ, uh, an appearing of Christ in the Old Testament perhaps. And if you don't think that's a thing, go back, go read 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4. Go read Jude 5, or go back and, and watch last week's sermon. It is truly a thing, a, a a Christophany is a real thing. So Melchizedek is either a Christophany or he plays into the typology of Christ. He is what we would call a type of Christ, a person who patterns certain things about Christ and who points us forward to the true Christ. He images certain things that are meant to uh, catch our attention and see those things fulfilled in Jesus Christ. So Melchizedek in Genesis chapter 14 is one of those two things. Either way, he foreshadows and brings our attention back to Jesus. And I'm not going to get into all the ways that he does that. Again, go back, watch last week's sermon. It's all there. Uh, but if you, uh, it, I guess if you weren't here, go watch it. If you need a refresher, go watch it. Uh, but I'll say that we can look back at Genesis 14 at this point, knowing the identity of, uh, of Melchizedek, and we can we can see Genesis 14 in light of what Hebrews chapter 7 teaches us of this man. We can see Genesis 14 not so dimly anymore, but illuminated, in fact, with the glory of Christ. Melchizedek is a Christ-like figure that sheds light on this particular story in Genesis 14. So as we revisit this passage today, we should be able to see what's happening just a little bit more clearly and, and maybe even understand how we can apply a certain example from Abram to our own lives and to our church. So let's go ahead, let's read through the text here together, starting in verse 17, and we'll go all the way through 24, and then we'll dig into it. After Abram's return... From the defeat of Ketaleomer and the kings who were with him, the king of Sodom went out to meet him at the valley of Shaveh, that is, the king's valley. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was priest of God Most High, and he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram by God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be God most high who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And Abram gave him a tenth of everything. And the king of Sodom said to Abram, give me the persons, but take the goods for yourself. But Abram said to the king of Sodom, I have lifted my hand to the Lord God most high, possessor of heaven and earth, that I would not take a thread or a sandal strap or anything that is yours, lest you should say, I have made Abram rich. I will take nothing but what the young men have eaten and the share of the men who went with me. Let Aner, Eshkol, and Mamre take their share." 
to kind of help put this into perspective, some of you may have been, you may have watched the Olympics this last year. Uh, this last summer in Paris, right? And you may have, rem- you may remember that there was a, a little bit of a controversy at the very opening of it. The opening ceremony included something that that truly was quite offensive and quite controversial. Uh, they had certain members of the LGBT community that dressed in a certain way and posed in a certain way that was uh, to sort of mimic and mock the Last Supper. And to Christians, that ought to be offensive. A lot of people did not care for that, and and rightfully so. And there were a lot of companies who said, ooh, that's not a very good image. But there was one company in particular uh, called C Spire. They are a tech firm here in the United States that had already sponsored the Olympics. They had already paid for millions of dollars worth of ad space. And this event took place, and they said, pull all of our ads. We don't we, we don't want to be associated with this whatsoever. We don't want to be associated with the Olympics at all this year now. It's just basically they said, we cannot support that. We cannot support that. And, and at the heart of this passage, I think, is a very, very similar thing. We, we, we have a man who says, I cannot support that, basically. And the reason I wanted to cover this passage again and not just leave it with last week, you know, just understanding the identity of Melchizedek, uh, I wanted to cover this again because Abram's actions in this passage are, are hugely informative to what faithful, faithful believers ought to be allowing and avoiding in their lives. What we should say, I can support that too, and what we should say, I cannot support that too. And this passage shows us that at times, Abram was in fact a man of conviction, and that conviction was a development of his growing faith. He was maturing in his faith. And so here's the big idea that I want us to look at this morning. Our stewardship, let me put it this way, our stewardship communicates what we bind ourselves to. Our stewardship, what we do with our time, what we do with our talents, what we do with our tithes, with our our money, sometimes will show the depth of our conviction. What we support, who we support, and how we support them speaks volumes. And that also goes for what we choose not to support, the things that we avoid. And so we're going to look at today's passage in those terms, in terms of stewardship and conviction, because I believe that the Abram shows us a very godly example to be followed here. So first, we need to set this up. We need to frame the passage correctly. We need to to see the conflict that this passage introduces to us. And it's, we see it verses 17 through 21, but the, the main introduction of it is these first two verses, 17 and 18. After Abram gets back from, from this big battle where he, he defeats the, the uh, kings of the east, The text says, the king of Sodom went out to meet him at the valley of Shaveh, that is the king's valley, and Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was priest of God most high. So those two verses appear to be completely harmless, right? I mean, there's there's nothing here that that seems to be uh, indicative of any type of conflict that's taking place. In fact, Abram just got done with conflict, didn't he? he? He went off to war over Lot's life, over his soul. He defeated these four kings from the east, Ketaleomer and his, and his buddies. Abram beat the superpowers of that region of that day. The conflict, as far as we're concerned, should be over. And here he is at this point, returning with all of the possessions and all of the people that were, that were taken captive before from Sodom, that, that he has now freed from Ketaleomer. And he gets to the Valley of Shaveh, which is um, it's right next to what is modern-day Jerusalem. It would have been back then, at this time of, of, of history, it would have been uh, Salem. Uh, And it's here that we see this very important meeting between Abram and two kings. And if you would, I'd like for you to pay very particular attention with me to who these kings are, because it is the identity of these kings that provides for us the basis of the conflict that we find within the text. Now, we already know who Melchizedek is. We covered, we spent 40 minutes on Melchizedek last week. We studied him pretty in depth. Melchizedek is king of Salem, which means, according to the author of Hebrews, it means king of peace. Salem means peace. Melchizedek 
is also by translation of his name, according to the book of Hebrews, king of righteousness. His name is made up of two Hebrew words, Melka and Sedek. Melka means king, Sedek means righteous. And so we put that together. His name is king of righteousness. And that's, remember, that's one of the ways in which he, he points us toward Jesus. So I'm gonna leave that one right there for the moment. The king of righteousness has decided to meet Abram in the king's valley, but so did another king. We have re-entering the story, the king of Sodom. And we know from earlier in chapter 14 that the king of Sodom's name is Bera. And if we thought it important to look at the, the meaning of Melchizedek's name and title, I wanna show you also Bera's name and title. Bera in the Hebrew language is translated to this, son of evil. And some scholars have made the connection that they think that perhaps uh, Bera came to be known, that word came to be known among the Hebrew language as, as son of evil because of the reputation of Bera, king of Sodom. But what we have here is Bera in Hebrew, son of evil, king of Sodom. And Sodom has become a byword in, in all of world history, but especially in scripture. It has become a byword for destruction. And in the grand scope of world history, that's what we know about, that, that, that's how we tie things to, to Sodom. Wickedness and destruction, they were destroyed because of their wickedness. The word itself, Sodom, means burning, which can be synonymous with destruction which makes Bera's title king of destruction. Son of evil, king of destruction. And I'm just asking, right, are you, are you tracking with me? Do you know where I'm going with this right now? Like, I don't know that I have to belabor this particular point anymore because what we have now, two kings who have met Abram, are meeting Abram in, in the King's Valley, Melchizedek, king of righteousness, king of peace, and Bera, son of evil, king of destruction. These men and their cities and their kingdoms and their titles and their reputations are polar opposites. They are, they couldn't be more opposed to one another, right? That's, that's what we should see by way of their name, by way of their title, and probably by way of their reputation. And this helps frame the rest of the text for us. I mentioned this a few weeks ago. I think I mentioned this a few weeks ago, that so far, so much of what we have seen in the book of Genesis ha has been written in contrasting language. I mean, we could go back just to a few weeks ago where we see that Abram is between, he's camped out between two cities, Bethel to the west, Ai to the east. And we looked at the meaning of those names. Bethel is, is the house of God. Ai is a heap of ruins. And we know that there is some type of decision, some type of crossroads for him to navigate in that basically his physical location was uh, 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 indicative, I think, of his spiritual location, a spiritual crossroads. The theme of contrasts seems to set up the idea of crossroads in scripture. And going the way of the godly, he could go you know, to the west. Going the way of, of the wicked, he could go to the east. And I would argue this morning that our text today sets this up once again for Abram. We've got another crossroads for him, something else for him to navigate. He is meeting with two kings of opposing lives who stand for opposing things and who represent opposing lifestyles. And so what I think, I, what I think we are meant to anticipate from this is that Abram is gonna have a decision that he's gonna have to make here in this text. If there's all this contrasting language, we should know that there's going to be a decision that he has to make. The contrasting language anticipates a crossroad for Abram to navigate. Two kings stand before him one that represents righteousness, one that represents wickedness, evil, and destruction. And I think we are to see this text through that particular framework. And I think that these kings make themselves known, I think they identify themselves quite well by way of their words and, and by way of their, their, their attitudes. I look, look, at the, look at the first words that come out of these kings' mouths. When we get to verse 19, Melchizedek speaks first. And he said, Blessed be Abram by God most high, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be God most high, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And so right off the bat, we see that Melchizedek reveals himself here to be a man of God. 
This is the first time that we see God referred to in Scripture as God Most High, El Elyon is, is the translation. And in a land, if you think about this, in a land that is filled with people who worship all types of gods, pagan gods, Melchizedek places his God at the very top of them all. He says, Most High God. This God is supreme. I worship the Most High God. And Melchizedek offers a blessing from God Most High to Abram, and he offers praise to God Most High. Melchizedek starts the conversation off in that way. He, he, he blessed Abram, he praised God, and this is so important for us to take note of here, because the only words that we see from Melchizedek are riddled with God-honoring language. He shows himself to be a man of God. He, uh, as, as far as we're concerned, lives up to his name. And by contrast, since that's the, the, the way that we're looking at this passage is through a contrasting framework, look at how Bera, king of Sodom, enters the conversation. He says, give me the persons, but take the goods for yourself. And that's it. Those are, those are the only recorded words that we have from the king of Sodom in this story where Melchizedek offered Abram blessing and offered praise to God. We, we, we see God being honored from that king. Bera demanded a portion, and we see him honoring only himself in the text. He says, give me the, 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 the people, you take the goods for yourself. And literally, out of the Hebrew, the way that this translates is, give me the souls, you take the substance. Give me the souls, you take the substance. And scholars are split right down the middle on this one. Some say that the old rules of engagement included giving any recovered people back to their original king. And so they claim that Bera would have been well within his rights here to demand his people back. Uh, the same scholars would say that it's very gracious of Bera to offer Abram all of his possessions, especially after seeing that Abram was willing to give a tenth of them over to another king. But I would argue against that. I'd say Abram is not Bera's ally whatsoever. He's not his ally, and Abram has no responsibility to Bera whatsoever. Abram came by the, the spoils of, of war honestly. Abram could, if he so chooses, keep everything and everyone that he has freed from captivity from uh, Ketaleomer. And what, honest, think about this. What is Bera going to do about it? What is he going to do about it? Abram defeated the kings of the east. Bera ran cowardly from the kings of the east. So what is Bera going to do against Abram? And, and really, no matter how you look at this, whether Bera actually had a right to demand the return of his people or not, and I say not, his words, I think, show us his highest priority. Give me. Give me. And there's the evidential difference between these two kings that stand before Abram. One offers blessing to Abram. He offers praise to God. The other is more concerned with himself. And so these verses have set up for us this conflict. Good and evil have met Abram in the king's valley. They have made themselves known by way of their words and their attitudes. One has come to be in fellowship with Abram, to bless him, to praise God, while the other has come only, I would say, for his own self-interest and to collect what he believes is owed to him. And there will be an inevitable choice for Abram to make here. Not just seen and what he's going to do with the spoils of war, but also, I think, more importantly, who he's going to align himself with here and how he's going to do it. So we need to see how Abram navigates this conflict and, and see his thought process here. After Melchizedek blessed Abram, let's look at the response here. After he blessed Abram and he praised God, verse 20 says that Abram gave him, gave Melchizedek a tenth of everything. And then we go down and we see in verses 22 through 24, after Bera demanded his people back and offered Abram keep the rest, Abram responds to him with this, I have lifted my hand to the Lord God most high, possessor of heaven and earth, that I would not take a thread or a sandal strap or anything that is yours, lest you should say, I have made Abram rich. I will take nothing 
but what the young men have eaten and the share of the men who went with me. Let Aner, Eshkol, and Mamre take their share. So what we have here is a difference in responses, right? Abram paid a tithe to Melchizedek, which remember we, we talked about briefly last week. Uh, this action signified Abram's allegiance to the Lord. He recognized Melchizedek as, as a priest king who served the same God as Abram, which no doubt was very hard to find back then. And this great patriarch, as Hebrews puts it, tithed to this godly kingdom. He was tithing to, to, to the work of God's kingdom. And we can know that Abram recognized the God Melchizedek served as the same that Abram serves because of the repetition of language here. We see some, some repetition. Melchizedek said, blessed be Abram by God most high, possessor of heaven and earth. Those were Melchizedek's words first. And then Abram uses the same language. I've lifted my hand to the Lord, God most high, possessor of heaven and earth. We, don't, we haven't seen that language so far. I think it's important that Moses wrote it this way to show us that Abram recognizes they're worshiping the same God. By using the same language to describe God that Melchizedek used, Abram was showing that he and Melchizedek do, in fact, worship the same God. Abram recognized that Melchizedek's God is Abram's God, and that is the tie that binds them together. They are on the same plane of doctrine and theology. And I think it's clear from our text that Abram had a desire to align himself with with who it is that worships the one true God. He had a desire to align himself with righteousness. And so I don't want us to miss this, that the ways in which he, he does this is number one, he, he gives an offering in service to the Lord. Again, we talked about that last week. This, this is an act of allegiance to God, is an act of worship and an expression to declare where his heart and his treasures truly are. He, he gave the top treasures of his spoils to a godly king who is a type of Christ, possibly even a pre-incarnate Christ. And his tithe then, no doubt, we can assume, went to kingdom work, to the glory of God, that God would be glorified through the giving of this tithe and the stewardship of, these, uh, of this victory spoils. And we talked about that last week and how that ought to inform our own heart's affections toward our earthly possessions. It is a stewardship and good stewards give back to kingdom work, back for the glory of God. So Abram gave an offering and service to the Lord through Melchizedek. Abram also gave an oath to the Lord. I have lifted my hand to the Lord, God most high, that I would not take anything from you. That's what it means to lift your hand to the Lord, to, to make an oath to God. And the oath was evidently that if Abram would be successful in his endeavor to go after these kings of the east and save Lot's life, he would not keep anything or anyone that previously belonged to Sodom. And as for Abram's allies, Aner and Eshkol and Mamre, Abram left them to decide what they would take, if they would take any share of the spoils. They are not of Abram's household. Abram's not going to make a decision for them. But as for Abram and his house, they would not be seen taking a thing from Sodom. He would not make any sort of arrangements with this wicked king of Sodom. No deal, he says. Instead, he gave it all back to him, all back to Bera. And this, I do not think, should be seen as a gift. It should not be seen as a tithe or anything of that nature. This was not an offering to Bera. Abram's refusal to keep the spoils of war that came from Sodom was an absolute rejection of Sodom. He was rejecting Sodom. Abram did not want Sodom to have any claim of sponsorship over his life. He wanted to give them no cause to think that they were the ones who have made him prosper. And so I think what we can see here, we, we, we can look at Abram's actions and see them as such. First, Abram had a desire to support what is righteous or who is righteous. He connected to Melchizedek, king of righteousness, on the basis of their mutual worship of the same God. 
And so he tithed to the priest of God most high in support of the glory of God. And if he did that, if he, if he showed his desire to support righteousness, he also did this. He, he showed his conviction to avoid entanglements with the wicked. And so he denied the spoils of war that were rightfully his, and he rejected Bera, son of evil, king of destruction, all together. And I think ultimately that's, that's the main gist of this passage. This is a passage about allegiances. It's a passage about ties that bind us. And, and that's the big choice here. Would Abram, who's he going to bind himself to? Is he going to bind himself to the king of righteousness, the one who's, who's, who represents God's kingdom, or is he going to bind himself to the king of destruction, the one who represents wickedness? If he tied himself to Bera, king of Sodom, by keeping the plundered spoils of war, people would see less God and more Bera in his life. They would see Abram's wealth not as a fulfillment of God's promises of provision to Abram, but more as a result of a deal struck with, a, uh, with a, an evil king. They would say, Bera provided this for Abram. Bera made Abram rich. Bera is the sponsor that made Abram's life possible. And Abram wants to avoid any of that. He wants to avoid all glory to Bera. He wants to avoid entanglements with the wicked. Abram did the right thing in our text. He made the right choice. He showed himself to be a man of conviction. He chose essentially righteousness over riches. And he proved that he is willing to wait He's willing to wait for God's promises to come the right way through the right means than to buy into a lesser prize, a lesser promise from an evil king. And it's almost reminiscent of when Jesus was tempted in the wilderness by Satan. When you go to Matthew chapter 4 and, and Satan showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory and he said to him, all these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. And then Jesus said to him, Be gone, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. And we look at that, and we can see that, that in that text, the wicked one offered Jesus kingdoms, offered him glory to reign and rule over it all. But Jesus already knew that God has offered that to him already. That was a promise already made to, uh, by God that someday Jesus will be ruler and reigner over all things. And Jesus knew that he can wait for God's timing and be handed those things by God's hand, not by Satan's hand. In the same way, I think Abram already knew the promises that God had made to him are in God's hands and will come by God's timing in God's way, and he will not accept a lesser prize from a wicked man. And I think the story of Abram's faith Excuse me, I think this is a story of Abram's faith and his conviction and his allegiance and stewardship. And I'll say, may it be a very good lesson for us, a lesson of ties that bind us, a lesson of conviction and a lesson of stewardship. Godly conviction, church, is, is being able to discern between what is good and what is not good and, and having both the wisdom and the integrity to act in accordance with what is good. And church, I think that we need to apply this on, on multiple levels of our lives. We must both be people individually and a people corporately as a church of godly conviction. And I'm talking very specifically in terms of, of what we see in our text this morning, conviction of ties, conviction of association, conviction over what or who we allow ourselves to be tied to and how we allow ourselves to be tied or associated with them. I think it's very important because I think it affects our witness. I think it affects our credibility as lovers of righteousness. I think it affects our stewardship. I think it affects our faith. And I'm going to give you a couple examples here, and, and then I'm going to give you uh, a challenge to consider things for your own life. But as far as the church goes, ways uh, to apply this to, to, to the church, corporate conviction, we must be good stewards of our doctrine and our dollars. We'll put it that way. I like alliteration. Doctrine and dollars. Abram's example relates to both the tithes that we give and the God that we worship. He tied himself to Melchizedek on the basis that they worship the same God, and the physical means of that tie came in the form of a tithe. 
And that shows that Abram concerned himself with a stewardship of both doctrine and dollars, and so shall we. And in both cases, I think it's about guarding what comes in and what goes out. And as far as dollars are concerned, you know, we want every bit of our finances as a church to be intentionally used for kingdom work. That's why when we work on our budget every year before the annual meeting, we go through a reminder that our budget communicates our values in ministry. It communicates what it is that we're binding ourselves to, and we want every penny to be glorifying to the Lord. And because of that, you know, we, we vet different ministry opportunities. We, we, we vet our music because some of our, our money gets portioned out to certain songwriters and certain churches who produce the music that we use for, for our worship services. We vet our missionaries, which I think is an incredibly important thing. I used to work for a church that did not vet their missionaries well. And I remember we supported one missionary at that church who, who worked about 45 minutes away. He was on a college campus. Uh, and uh, we found out, I found out that he was preaching a gospel of, of, of you know, BLM and, and LGBTQ stuff, and he uh, would, would teach in his classes that, um, you know, all white people are racist, and, and it's just all this stuff that, that our church, we didn't share those values. It wasn't the same thing that we would preach, and we were, in fact, against many of those things, and I brought that to the leadership of the church and said, I think that this is a problem. I don't know that we should be supporting this missionary, and the leadership of the church said, well, his family all goes to this church and they give a lot of money, so we're just not going to do anything about that. And at that point, it's, okay, well, I'm going to go then. I'm out. And I landed here, right? That's, that's, that's my story, how I came here. But anything that our money goes toward or even where our money comes from, we need to pay attention to. I say that even where our money comes from. Let's just say uh, uh, we will not knowingly accept any... Um, ill-gotten gains. Uh, Lane, we have, what, about $242,000 left on our mortgage, right? He sent that, he sent that out this last week. $242,000 left on our, our mortgage for the, for the back part, the addition of our building here. And Lane says that his big dream is that that would be taken care of before he kicks the bucket. His words, not mine, right? His words, not mine. And I would say that someone, let's say someone like Bernie Madoff or Pablo Escobar came in and dropped $240,000 cash and said, let's take care of that mortgage. We would say, no, we won't accept that. We can't accept your money. Or for some crazy reason, Planned Parenthood said they'd love to make a generous donation to Grandview Baptist Church. No, I'm sorry, we can't accept that. It puts us in cahoots with the wrong people. It ties us to things and to people that, that we should have no association with. And we take our, our finances seriously. We take our doctrine even more seriously. We are very serious about the doctrine within this church, the doctrine that gets uh, taught in this church, that comes in this church and out. And we are very serious about who we partner with based on doctrine. And I think that our, our stewardship of doctrine dictates who we can and who we cannot partner with as a church. And I'm going to give you an example, something that I get a lot of flack for from other churches in the community. But there's this thing called ecumenicalism, or, or some would just call it ecum ecumenism. And it's basically defined as a move toward unity among Christian groups. And it's very popular in what's called the emergent church. Uh, and it sounds fine, but I hate it. I hate it because Christian groups is a little too loosely defined these days. Barna Group recently published a study in which they asked questions of evangelical churches across the nation about the basic doctrines of the Christian faith. Questions like, did Jesus live a sinless life? Was he truly perfect? Is Satan real or is Satan imaginary? And Barna found that of these churches across uh, the, these evangelical churches across the United States, 70% of the churches in this country do not believe in the basic teachings of the Bible. 70% of the churches do not believe in the primary doctrinal issues, the salvation issues. They would not agree that Jesus lived a sinless life. They would not uh, agree with the basic foundational gospel truths that we have in our, that, that are revealed to us in scripture. And I would argue that that doesn't, that, that doesn't make them Christians at this point. I can't consider that a Christian group. 
That means that three out of the 350,000 churches in America, only 100,000 believe what the Bible teaches is true as far as the basics go. And here's where it gets really scary, church. Of those who say they do believe in the core teachings of the Bible, only 2% say they will teach them as far as current issues today. That is half a percent of all of the churches in the United States that teach the truth of the Bible. And that ought to alarm you. That alarms me. That is, that is horribly discouraging. And you better believe that that's not just out there in America. That's in our own communities too. We have so many churches right here in Esterville that, that don't preach primary doctrine. And, and we are often pressured to partner with them and participate with them in certain things in the name of ecumenicalism, in the name of, of Jesus. But the thing is, we do not preach the same Jesus. We don't believe in the same Jesus. And so can we in good conscience ally ourselves with those churches? And I say, I don't believe that we can because it results in us watering down the gospel in order not to offend an apostate church. Rather, we're told not to to tolerate false teaching, to watch out for false teachers, to know them and to stay away from them. There are, very f there, there are, there are a few churches in this community that, that I'm very pleased to partner with. But we steward the incoming and outgoing doctrine as well as we possibly can. And now church, I wanna ask you to, uh, how can we apply Abram's example on a personal level? You know, I, I just got done talking about a corporate level. Um, how do we apply conviction, his example, on a personal level. I'm not going to tell you what your convictions ought to be. You, you need to be in the Word. You need to be in prayer. You need to come to some informed decisions in your own lives and in your own homes. But I will say that I think that we need to be awfully mindful of who and what we bind ourselves to individually. And I'll get you started. I want you to consider how Abram's example applies to your social life. Who are you tied to in your social life and how are you tied to them? And how might that be affecting your witness or your credibility as a lover of righteousness? How can you apply Abram's example to, say, your shopping patterns? Who do you support with your money and, and where does that money end up? Even consider if your shopping patterns take away from your giving patterns. How can you apply Abram's example to your entertainment patterns? There, there are actually a lot of people who have... Uh, uh, been applying this one, whether they're Christians or not. You know, we have, um, you know, Disney has come out with some woke stuff, and, and Disney Plus has lost an enormous amount of, of subscribers because of that. They say, I can't support that. Um, the CEO of Netflix has come out in, uh, in support of a, a particular presidential candidate, and people said, I'm not going to support that. They pull their subscriptions. And speaking of that, how, how do you apply Abrams' example to your voting patterns? Oh, I don't want to talk about politics behind the pulpit, but we're going to now. I don't even think it's a matter of the person that you are voting for, to be honest. I don't think it's a matter of the person you're voting for. I am not convinced that I have to like the person that gets my vote. I think I have a Christian responsibility to consider their platform and to consider their policies and consider the end result. I have a Christian responsibility to consider the result of my vote and how I use my vote, how I steward my vote to further God's kingdom and to show love to my neighbor. Amen. So which platform and whose policies are most likely to result in what is good? Which platform and whose policies are most likely to align with the biblical purpose of government? The biblical purpose of government is, is to be an extension of God's wrath to the wrongdoer and, and to reward those who are good and to protect innocent life. So which platform and whose policies most align with what is godly and righteous? And as a Christian, as a follower of Jesus Christ, which platform am I able to slap my name on in support for? And it's scary right now. We're two weeks away right? Two, I think we're about two weeks away from, from a very big and very important election, and it would be irresponsible of us as individuals who are able to vote to, to, to go into this election without considering who it is that would promote godliness, who it is that whose end result of their platform and their policies would be more God-honoring. And I cannot tell you how to vote. I cannot tell you uh, where to shop. I cannot tell you what subscriptions to get rid of. 
But I can and I will encourage you to consider who and what you tie your name and your finances to as a follower of Jesus Christ. I want you this morning to think of yourself almost as a NASCAR driver, right? They, they wear those jumpsuits that have, have their, their sponsors patched all over them, and these sponsorships are, are an endorsement, both of the company, you know, the company's endorsing the driver and also the driver endorsing these companies. And I want you to think about your endorsements. Think about your sponsorships, your stewardship. And if you had to, if you were forced to wear your endorsements and your sponsorships on your clothes for everyone to see, what is it that we're going to see? What is it that we're going to see? Would you be proud of those things? Would they reflect a life that values righteousness? Would they reflect a good stewardship of your convictions and your dollars and your doctrine? I think Abram's example to us in the text this morning, we can apply to a thousand different things in our lives. And I think it's up to us, to each of us, to practice wisdom and to practice discernment and to develop our convictions under the authority of God's word and practice loving and endorsing what and who stands for righteousness and cutting ties with any entanglements of wickedness. Amen, church? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to gather together as a family of believers to worship you this morning, and we thank you for what binds our hearts together this morning, our love and our affection for you and our salvation in Jesus Christ. And Lord, may we seek to follow you with the entirety of our lives as we wrap up our time together this morning. I, I want to give special thanks for your word. Lord, this passage this morning is, is flowing from a, a bittersweet example. Bitter because it may cause us difficulty in pursuing a more godly stewardship of our time and our talents and our doctrine and our, our money. It may cause us to see that we need to cut some certain things out of our lives or certain people, even out of our inner circle of our affections. And, and, but also sweet, Lord, because we know that we glorify you in following through with truly godly convictions. And Lord, there is no greater purpose for our lives than to glorify you. Give the strength and boldness to be people and a people committed wholly to you, lovers of righteousness and avoiders of wickedness. And Father, may you see our lives and be pleased. It is in your name we pray. Amen.